webinars that we've uh, been uh, doing at New Vic, holding on in our African Studies Centre. Uh, Richard has kindly agreed to uh, attend the meeting from Oxford to talk about the cultures and practice of warfare in African history. Uh, I could try to introduce Richard, but he has a, a really extensive um, kind of uh, biography of uh, academic study and teaching African history. So perhaps you could introduce yourself, Richard, far better than I would be able to. Um, well, I mean, to, to, to keep it um, brief, um, yeah, I'm a historian of Africa, um, mostly focusing on the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, I, I, I do war. <laughs> um and um that's both a kind of lit what i would term lit pre-colonial so um kind of long 19th century type approach um and at the other end of the kind of chronological spectrum um i deal with liberation struggle for example um from the 1950s onwards in particular particularly in in the horn of africa and um uh, the Great Lakes of East Africa, um, and um, I've published a bit and gone on about various aspects of war for far too long. <laughs> I know, um, just for everyone here, we do have a copy of your book, Warfare ah, there you go. in Africa yeah. History in the College Library, which I ordered many years ago. Very good, nice. I just recently purchased your book on Buganda as well. Right. Oh, that, that's 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 that, that's going back a bit. That's going back a bit. Well, yeah, and I also noticed that you were um, working at the University of Asmara then, which mm. is a place I visited a number of years ago, and the remnants of war were all around us. Yeah. And that was in about ninety five. Okay. Oh wow! There was, there was the whole um, kind of almost like museum to the the revolutionary struggle there with between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Yeah. So it was quite interesting the way that, in a sense, the, the way the country had been formed by war, you would find there were monuments to Italian generals around, um, mm. so one or two of those, and then you would actually find um, mm. stuff from the much later period of the war with Ethiopia and went to um, Masawa and saw mm. Haile Selassie's bombed out palace there. Mm. Yeah, that, that's that's fascinating. You, so you, you you were there at a really interesting moment. Of course, Eritrea had just become um, independent, and um, I went out um, to teach for a few years at the university, and that and that really changed quite a lot of my focus. I mean, I just went out for a job. You could, this was the mid '90s. You couldn't get a job in African history um, in this country anywhere, and I ended up going back out to um, the region, um, and that's what sort of piqued my interest in um in in, mo in liberation struggle and and the way that a lot of those kind of um supposedly revolutionary military movements often tried to link with earlier uh, yeah. uh, cycles of war and, and and cultures of militarism okay yeah now it was a very interesting place in the way that in a sense the struggle was all around us uh wherever yeah. you went felt that you know in a sense the struggle was what defined the country yes yeah? okay good all right now i've prepared a number of questions you could say no i'm not going to answer those i'll talk about what i want to but they're very general and they're just like they're kind of i'm not saying i'm bowling you easy balls but i'm just sort of giving you stuff that i think well you know that you could just say, well, okay, I'll answer it in this way or whatever. Okay. No, no listen. In in, in 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 after a day of homeschooling, I'm 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 quite keen to be bold, easy balls, honestly. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, so uh, just for the you know, for myself and the audience, really, uh, we're going to record the talk, and then what we'll do, we'll put it on our website, and we might even not not cut you out, but cut things up with captions. So um you know because it can be used as a teaching resource by people afterwards so um if we're looking at like medieval uh, africa and i would like you to sort of get up really you know by the end really of our 
session to the present day. If we're looking at that kind of medieval period, you know, what, what, what regions of Africa, you know, do you see warfare in? Is it all over Africa or in certain parts? You'll find more intensive uh, militarism and fighting. Well, I think I think the 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 first thing to say uh, in response to that specifically um, is that we we we're really crippled, I think, um, methodologically. So it's it, this is really a source question. Um, so a lot of there for the for the medieval period, if we if we want to use that kind of um, chronolo uh, chronological terminology, um, mm. there are big blank spaces in our knowledge, frankly. Um, so there is some archaeological evidence, for example, from the West African coast um, that, that point towards particular battles or military structures. Um, but it's really sketchy. Uh, essentially, before, before the period of the Atlantic slave trade, really, it's, it's, it's sketchy for huge chunks of sub-Saharan Africa. So um, for the medieval period, I mean, when I when I teach it, and this is mostly to uh, uh, post grads, uh, a master's paper. Um, for the medieval period, I use two examples. One is the West African savanna, um, and this is this will be kind of Toby Toby's kind of area of expertise. Yeah. So the big the big kind of um, horse-based, a uh, caval cavalry-based um, states um, across modern-day Mali, Niger, that kind of region, um, for which we do have some evidence of, you know, the kinds of armies they used, what the armies were used for, um, um, and we do have a, a smattering of, of contemporary accounts, usually, of course, by outsiders coming down into the region and um, uh, written in Arabic originally. Um, and the other example I'd use is Ethiopia. Um, and Ethiopia, and you, you, you may be aware of this already, I mean, Ethiopia is sometimes uh, problematic in the teaching of African history because it's sometimes posited as unique, distinctive. Um, it's its own little sub-region. Of course, Ethiopians themselves often say, well, we're not really African. Um, um, I generally reject all of that, and I, I use Ethiopia as, um, you know, we, we, we pay due attention to what makes Ethiopia distinctive, um, but it does illustrate some broader patterns um, in um, the early formation of, uh, of, of semi-professional armies, the relationship between the army and the political center, for example. Um, and uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopia is also quite good for bringing in ideology. Um, so what actually motivates uh, people to fight? Um, and obviously in the case of Ethiopia, you've got a kind of what we can broadly call a kind of Christian nationalism um, with its particular version of um, the Old Testament or an interpretation of the Old Testament. Um, so that's quite useful. And there are other for that for that period, say much before 1500, um, we really don't have a huge amount of evidence about a how armies are actually organized uh, or indeed b why they fight we, we we can we can intuitively suggest that there are reasons um why people fight universally um but those two examples the west african savanna and um, the ethiopian highlands are two areas for that earlier period that we have a bit more evidence and we, we you, you can get a bit more concrete about motivation and um and structure yeah okay brilliant um thank you so if we when do we begin to sort of start finding evidence of um fighting in uh africa is it really around the time of the development of the slave trade in west africa or you know yes i mean i i think that's where so the the big sort of chunk of atlantic africa so thinking of um say senegal down to angola um and that's a region that obviously um from the 16th century onwards is brought into an atlantic world 
Um, and that's when a, a lot more evidence, I'll, I'll, I'll possibly come back to the idea of evidence in a, in a second, say a bit more about that. But that's uh, when we, we can see um, major military states uh, arising, we can, we can um, uh, judge motivation and structure a lot more, we can look at cultures of militarism. Um, and it's really the, yeah, the year of the slave trade um, draws all that out in, in uh, quite starkly. But again, not unproblematically, uh, problematically. if we look at the sources that we often rely on, um, they are unfortunately European, so yeah. you know when you're teaching this stuff, and and this is also you know it it can be it's it's great fun as well as being a challenge. But you have to take sort of bring people through um, the kinds of texts that they they use to reconstruct African history, and they're often by hugely racist individuals who were either you know defending the slave trade, who thought it was a jolly good idea because they were saving Africans from Africa, um, or they're written by um, abolitionists. Um, who uh, equally have uh, a drum to bang because they they also want to depict Africa as a place of of uh, intrinsic uh, barbarism and and, and 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 savagery. So you've got to kind of a lot of those sources can be very rich, um, but they're infused with this kind of um, cultural misunderstanding as well as overt racism. Um, but certainly the Atlantic slave trade is the period that we can, you, 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 can, you can begin to reconstruct African war and militarism uh, in a much more granular way. Now, if, yeah. you know, there are other areas where um, we have uh, oral histories, um, which are recorded, you know, often they're recorded in the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, and they enable us to go uh, back to the say 16th, 17th centuries uh, in East Africa, for example, around the Great Lakes area. And uh, you can begin to kind of um, pick out some themes in terms of how wars are fought, why they're fought, who they're fought by. Um, again, however, those oral histories need to be treated with great caution. They're often, they're often written at a particular, they're written down, committed to writing at a particular moment, usually at the start of the colonial period. Um, and they're often regarded as um, almost scripture, really. They become, they become uh, tradition. So they're, they're, they're quite tricky to use as historical sources. Um, but if, we, if you wanted to avoid European misunderstandings, you can use some um, uh, African voices which are problematic in a slightly different way. Yeah, so it's kind of like the usual thing of trying to sort of um, compare, contrast, triangulate the evidence that you have. Exactly with. right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as much as possible. I mean, so, sometimes you can, you can corroborate the two. Um, you know, if if you get lucky, you can you can kind of piece together. Um, you know, an oral tradition will say, talk about a certain. Um, the, the reign of a particular king and we you can work out that it's say uh, 10 generations back and that might coincide with a contemporary account and you can sort of match them up and um, reconstruct a little bit that way okay yeah um sort of a question there really is it um so when we're looking at that um colonial or you know the period of the slave trade we can sort of like see we've already got the development of certain African empires and we think, well, OK, we've had, you know, um, warfare being used to win those. What was the impact of that European um, kind of connection, really, or contact really on, on warfare in Africa? Then does that, did that ramp it up, as it were? You mean in terms of uh, direct European influence on war or, or simply them? Being present at the coast, being present at the coast, and maybe having some sort of impact with, you know, raiding for say, or, you know. Yeah, I mean the, the um, so two things. One is that clearly um, the slave trade itself. So the presence of beginning with the Portuguese and then 
actually much more intensively the English, Dutch and the French as, as slave traders, um, directly leads to the rise of a number of really prominent states, either on the African coast or just in the interior, so a little bit in the hinterland. Um, so there are a number of examples of that, people, places like Dahomey uh, or Yaw, uh, just to some extent, I guess, Asante, you know, and these are states that we know did not exist before, say, 1600. So their their rise is uh, is directly linked to the presence of Europeans buying slaves on the coast. Now, of course, they go on to do much more kind of complex, sophisticated and nuanced things, um, but they are in origin in many ways rooted in uh, external demand, so the export of human beings. Um, in other ways, uh, Europeans do um, influence African war in the sense, of course, that they bring guns. Um, it's, it's fairly unusual that Europeans take part in African war or, say, serve alongside African soldiers. There are some examples of it. I mean, probably the most famous example is in the pre-colonial kingdom of Congo, where Portuguese musketeers do take part in, in uh, local combat um, and, you know, possibly introduce ideas about armor and particular military formations and so on. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, before the 19th century, it's pretty rare, uh, mostly because Europeans tend to keel over um, uh, through uh, malaria or heat exhaustion or whatever. Um, and in fact, in any case, they don't really need to involve themselves in African war um, as long as the big slave raiding states are supplying slaves to them at the coast. There's actually no need to go and, to go and intervene. Um, but there's no question that the Africa's import of firearms does have an influence on how they fight, obviously enough. So they, you know, um, in some cases they, they fight in a different kind of formation. Um, they attempt, I guess you could broadly say to, um, uh, in, in an echo of what happens in early modern Europe, um, to uh, uh, volley and fire much more efficiently. So that, that involves kind of a different sort of regimentation. Um, but they, most African states do that independently. They, they learn how to use firearms themselves. They don't, they very rarely have a European saying, you know, point this way, or, you know, if I were you, I'd kind of volley and fire this way. Um, that only comes much later in the colonial period. Yeah, so they kind of like adapted their own techniques to, is it like the new technology that was coming from Europe in terms of like, um, you know, um, firepower, like uh, guns and so on? Yeah, so the- Yes, that... exactly. So, um, you know, um, uh, bre uh, breech loaders, of course, come much um, later, but um, muskets, a particular type of gun, you know, manufactured in places like Birmingham, which was very specifically for the African market, actually. Um, so they were rather more crudely made uh, and often quite dangerous. In fact, they had a tendency to blow up um, and often they're not they're not actually very efficient in the rainy season because you can imagine kind of... Mm shoving um, stuff down your musket while it's raining and so on. Um, but yeah, there was, there, there's, there's, a, there's a thriving, particularly in the 18th century and, and um, expanding in the 19th century, there's a big market for uh, firearms um, in Africa. All oh, right. Have, have we got like records from Britain about that, you know, like from factories or you're, you're just looking at ships in, you know, if, if you were looking at that as a subject, would that be stuff that you'd find in ships inventories or even, you know, like company records in Britain? Oh, yeah, very much so. Very much so. I mean, um, uh, guns for the African markets, uh, th those kinds of trade guns, um, hugely important that they'll, they'll, they'll pop up in um, ships inventories. Um, and um, there'll, there'll be, I, I guess, company records. Yeah, the big, I, I mentioned the Midlands, they were, they happen to be particularly big in terms of producing these, these sorts of firearms specifically for um, the overseas market. So that, that, that would all be uh, recordable, yeah. Okay, brilliant, thank you. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of really interesting for historians to sort of say, well, okay, the, there, there are these kind of, um, documents and sources and you know once you begin to triangulate them and put them together you can see really okay 
as mm. a sort of driving link. It's not, you know, it, it's just not one way, you know, stuff going out, stuff coming in and being in, imported. Yeah. And also yeah. it's like that adaption really of African uh, societies to, you know, to just, you know, what's going on in the wider world and, uh, and their own vicinity. Okay. Great. Yes, exactly. And, and and there is a real fusion there. So on the one hand, you've got, um, and it's important to emphasize, if you like, the kind of globalization aspect of this. So you do have particularly a big um, um, Atlantic economy involving the import of this new Western technology. But at the same time, um, African states, and it's, it's, it is mostly kind of state level structures that are most efficient at using mm. this technology. Um, are building cultures of militarism around uh, that new technology. And um, that's something which is quite independent of, you know, straightforward transactional operations. You know, here are some guns, give me some slaves. African states are building, um, we could say ethnic identities, but certainly state level ideologies around um, the, the 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 practice of war um yeah. uh heroism courage all of mm. these ideas that we associate uh with with um with combat are are being are being kind of developed independently okay yeah, okay we'll pick that point up later when we look at maybe you know africa in the 19th and 20th century yeah um one of the things i was going to say was like um if we're looking at uh the I was thinking about the recruitment and funding of armies, really. So if you could say something about that, you know, I mean, if we're thinking about, say, Britain, Britain, one of the things we study here is Britain in the 17th century. And you look at this kind of pivotal date in, the, in about 1644 with the development of the new model army, you know, a professionalised army of professional soldiers led by professionals, not just because people have rank and title in society what are we looking at in Africa? Are we looking at something similar? Or are we still looking at structures based on, you know, maybe the local hierarchies, really? Yeah. Um, really tricky to generalize, but I'm going to generalize. Um, <laughs> and I think I think I, I think it's broadly true that with with um, a few exceptions, um, Africa doesn't have much in the way of a sta of standing professional armies much before the 19th century. Um, now, there are exceptions to this. I mean, arguably, again, somewhere like Ethiopia um, probably does have um, what we would term a professional army and, a, and, 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 a, and a, 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 a military class, as it were, that serves society and serves the government and so on. Um, it's also true in uh, the West African savanna states I mentioned earlier, where, of course, cavalry, uh, just as in Western Europe, is a big investment. You train people to ride horses. You, you need retainers around them. Those people tend to be professional and full-time soldiers, and they have ranks and they have status, um, largely because of the money invested in them. Um, the key thing to remember about much of sub-Saharan Africa uh, is that um, horses tend to be killed by the tsetse fly. So trypanosomiasis, for example, um, is, 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 is one of the single biggest dis, uh, influences on the way African war is fought. Um, and that means basically that much of African warfare is fought on foot, um, which obviously has implications for um, status and hierarchy and the kinds of armies that develop as a result. So it's probably br broadly true certainly before the 19th century, that most African armies are still part-time militias. Um, you, you will have societies where uh, particular chiefly titles will have implied in them military command, but it's usually alongside something else. So, you know, you can be uh, a chief of a district with, you know, um, fiscal responsibility, and during war, then you become the commander of the left wing of the army or something like that. Um, but that's a very part time role. It's, it's certainly not a full time job. Um, so often what 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 the evidence suggests, um, certainly for the earlier period, um, is that is that armies are called up 
mm. uh, according to need and according to agricultural calendars, for example. Um, so, you know, you don't take large numbers of people away from uh, the harvest. Um, and um, it's only later on that there's more evidence of kind of social structures being built around hierarchies and professionalism. Um, and I, there's some evidence of that during the era of the slave trade in places like Dahomey, um, but it's much more common in the 19th century when war does begin to get um, uh, professionalized across the continent. Okay, right. Um, so that, yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you've got, as you say, those kind of militias that, you know, people within groups who were, uh, knew that they would have to do some military service. Um, is there much evidence of training or did it just like, you know, we tend to like think of like, you do your 12 weeks basic training. Well, what would you do <laughs> in those kind of periods that we're talking about? Or is it you, you pick up things from the, the, the other people as it were? Um, there, there's very, um depending on the area, but I, 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 there's very little evidence of, of training. Um, again, a lot of that, um, a lot of the kind of granular evidence really only comes into focus much later in the 19th century, um, when you get a lot more kind of eyewitness accounts of people kind of pretending to attack a village and stuff. And, and, and that um, often, of course, the way this is described by Europeans is it's all, it's all a bit silly and it's just a bit of a game. But it's very clear that, I mean, if you if you read the evidence clear, uh, carefully, um, this is, in fact, a training exercise. Um, mm. But um, I think for the for the um, the earlier period and even for many areas in the 19th century, um, training is not much in evidence. Um, that's not to say that it didn't uh, it didn't happen, but I, I, I think it's kind of it's almost it's Im implicit within the idea of a part-time militia, for example, that's called up in the case of need, that there isn't really, you know, um, a, a, a great need for training, um, okay. or that at least that, that in certain societies, people people understand how war is fought. And if, 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 if war is fought in a particular way and has been for a very long time, then people accept that that's, that's you know, we don't really need training for that. Um, it's, it's, it's a really interesting question, actually, um, because in some ways, what it, it, it makes me think that there's more evidence, actually, for how people behave in war, which is, is actually related to the idea of whether or not you train for it. But do you have the heart for it? So there are there are cultures that make a great deal of, you know, such and such an oral tradition was a great hero because he killed 20 other people and he and he and he was hugely courageous. And that is often seen as um, uh, as as almost trumping uh, any training you might have uh, is, is, is do you have uh, the mm -hmm. character and it's 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 often explicitly masculine um, you know are you man enough to actually do this rather than has he trained enough um, mm -hmm. and actually in in terms of historical memory uh, much more is used of uh, much more emphasis is placed on the idea of of courage and character than you know he was thoroughly well trained at what he what he did yeah um yeah i i just have to say something myself there you know my father was Su from sudan so i um i was brought up with stories of osman digna you know osman digna who you know um my dad yes it is yeah eulogies about o osman digna that's right that's right <laughs> yeah and really men and you know sitting down to a sheep for his dinner his lunch kind of thing I see that. Yeah. So, go, go, please go on. No, they're, they're hugely important. Um, these figures, and of course, what what what's what? Um, it's 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 often you know you've got the big figure themselves, and 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 the kind of the eulogies around them, and so on. But it's also what they represent. Um, mm. And of course, as time goes on, more stuff is is, is kind of attributed to them, and they mm. become mm. almost kind of um, holders of national character, or or. Yeah. or attributes of national character right yeah i mean that yeah exactly because you know my dad bought when was he born 1919 he would he would you know he's very much from that nationalist generation and so you look at someone who never who who couldn't be um 
Uthman Digna could not be defeated by the British. They would capture him, they imprisoned him, but he never broke his um, loyalty and belief yes. in Muhammad right. Ahmad Ahmadi. And yeah. he represented all those kind of, you know, Sudanese values of, you know, bravery, but fortitude mm. and just, you know, loyalty, really. So I yeah. kind of, my young self, I was beginning to put all this away, really. And then, you know, this conversation's helping to bring it out, really. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was very interesting stuff, you know. And then when you kind of look at that period, it's very much based around these kind of extraordinary military victories that can only be explained by kind of like, you know, belief in God kind of thing and rightness of the cause. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it, 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 exactly, exactly. And, and, and the role of, um, you know, on the one hand, religion, and we certainly get this in the Islamic um, zone, um, where, you know, religious insurgency is, of course, um, divinely ordained, and the, the same is true of, uh, of Christian Ethiopia. Um, but even in, even in those areas outside um, uh, what we call, you know, the the the, the reach of the big global um, religions, um, you you get the the role of the supernatural being very important. So you know, um, warriors in oral tradition being able to fly, um, yeah. uh, for example. Um, uh, although in uh, you know one quick anecdote, I mean it, it, it's 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 um, often not a huge advantage as it turns out. I mean there's there's a very um, nice oral tradition from Uganda where um, one of their great warrior heroes can indeed fly and he does it he does a good job for a little while firing arrows and the army down below are like oh my god where's this coming from then they realize he's up there so they shoot him down and they kill him <laughs> and that's mm. the kind of the end of the story but of course you know he then goes on to become um the god of war um yeah. even though his flying skill didn't really serve him that well um, and in fact they they they, they that, that are his his army went on to lose the battle yeah I'm just going to say that um, just to the audience, if anyone wants to post any questions, you know, in about 10, 10 minutes, we'll be taking questions from the audience. OK, so um, that's really interesting what you were saying there about those, um, the way that those traditions were then maybe fueled. Um, you know, in a sense, like all countries have national myths, you know, the you know we, we've seen the attack on the white house or not the white house capitol hill recently as you know like we're almost like we're like tea party insurgents really you know? we're going to retake our democracy from uh the people who stole it or the people who are trying to impose yeah. Yeah. this thing on us so if anyone's got any questions please ask so um just going back into that in uh, I was going to ask you a question about the military fiscal state, but I'm quite interested in what you've got to say about the, in the sense, the colonial period, really. So, you know, conquest, but also how, in the sense, the development of a new style of army or, if not army, then defence forces, they were often called in different countries, really. Yeah. You know, what effect that that had on warfare in Africa. And in a sense, going forward, how has that shaped warfare now, really? Yeah. It, um, in terms of colonial armies themselves, um, there's uh, one, one thing to kind of say uh, um, to begin with is, is that um, the actual conquest of the continent, I think, is needs to be more um carefully understood i think in terms of what happens in africa beforehand um mm. so um forgive me this just happens to be something i'm kind of working on at the moment or or, or it was before the pandemic just blew all my research plans out of the water um but that that the, the the idea of the scramble for africa for example um often in, is is assumed to involve um, European conquering armies, basically sweeping all aside and and establishing um, a new kind of colonial order, which becomes which become African nation states. Um, in, often, in actual fact, of course, most European armies made use of African soldiers, and um, lots of those soldiers uh, had had grown up in the violent turmoil of the nineteenth century. So they already had a set of particular set of skills. Um, but there's no doubt, yeah, that, I mean, colonial armies um, 
do involve a, fund, a fundamental shift because colonial armies are um, first and foremost used for internal control, not for external adventures. So they are, um, they're much more inward looking than one would normally imagine a setting army to be. You know, I mean, lot, lot, lots of early colonial armies are fundamentally concerned with, yes, the suppression of the occasional revolt, but mostly the collection of tax. Um, and, you know, that in, in many ways, they work alongside early police forces and doing, in, in doing that job. So through the colonial period, um, uh, I guess the longer term impact of, of the colonial ethos is that armies are for internal monitoring and and, and control um, and, and, and not for, you know, they don't sit at the border, you know, looking for external enemies or are um, very rarely are, are sent to um, invade other territories. And of course, there are exceptions to that. Um, Africa's experience in the First World War um, and, um, and in the Second World War, where you do get the deployment of colonial armies in other territories um, for a, a range of reasons. Um, but fundamentally, um, colonial armies are police forces. Um, they, they are insular, they're inward looking. Um, and they're, of course, because of, because of the very roots of their formation, so their um, the idea of the European conquest and European administration, um, they are associated with political authority, um, and to a very large extent, armies then become associated with whoever happens to be in charge. Um, so you could argue that you know one of one of the kind of the the, the tropes of of modern Africa, for example, is the coup d'etat and the general kind of overthrowing another general and so on. Um, in actual fact, that, that fusion of military and political authority can be traced to the colonial period. Um, in other ways, of course, it can be traced even further back because the, you know, what's very clear is that a lot of African armies already had that inbuilt. Um, mm. that in fact, political and military power were not separable. Um, and so the colonial period is really the latest stage in that, I would argue. This is this is the kind of long term evolution of uh, of, of an African militarism. Yeah, I mean, that's very much like Sudan that in the first 20 years of the, the condominium 1898 to around the end of the First World War, it was basically yeah. run as a kind of military state with divided into districts, fine. But actually, most of the uh, what eventually became the political service were were not civilians; they were military officers. Yeah, and this is where get most of the kind of, um, in a sense, the memoirs and the biographies, you know, uh, yeah. and that tradition remain very strongly. Really, okay, mm. so that's very interesting. Really, in, if we're bringing that up into the modern era, as you said about the coup d'état, which in a sense, it's like a, I'm not saying it's just a phenomenon of the 60s, but the 60s, 70s going into the 80s. And now we seem to have an, a, a period where we have, a, a, in a sense, more established civilian governments, or are they military governments that have put on civilian clothes, as in maybe Nigeria, if I take mm. a guess there. Still seems to be the same group there. Um, what, what's the legacy there of that? warfare now and then in the sense the modern wars that are going on in Africa uh, uh, happening in Africa as we speak they're not huge but they are you've got these very localized but quite extreme conflicts I'm thinking about what's going on between uh, Eritrea and the north of Ethiopia at the moment yeah hmm. yeah so there um my goodness I suppose you could you could Okay, let's let's break them up into two um, broad strands. I mean, one one would be um, a phenomenon that we see um, really since the nineteen eighties, um, which is the kind of the, the the kind of supposedly illegitimate militia um, arising and, and mobilizing locally, often along ethnic or religious lines, um, and challenging some kind of status quo, imagined or otherwise. Um, and you you might use Somalia for example as an example um, of that. And then there are um, 
yes, the state level structures. So what's happened in, in Ethiopia, Eritrea recently, um, you know, these are these are these are armed forces which are rooted themselves in a tradition of being malicious. I mean, both all, you know, most of the most of the parties involved in the conflict in the Horn of Africa at the moment started life 40 something years ago, mostly in the, in the most of them in the early mid 70s, as very, very small groups of militias with no hope in hell of ever overthrowing um, existing regimes. Um, and um, they've proven extraordinarily successful in doing so. And um, you have in that process uh, a professionalization of their military culture. Um, um, and they started out, um, as they say, as kind of rebels and, and, and very much on the margins and have now become mainstream uh, interpreters of what is military culture and, and, and military policy across a, a, a very wide area. I mean, mm. you're, you're, you're absolutely right to say that if you like, the, the, the high noon of the coup d'etat was in the sort of 70s, to some extent, the 80s. Um, coup d'etats are now, at least, at least in theory, less tolerated by the African Union. Um, and uh, often people who lead coups are ostracized immediately by other heads of government. They're required to do so by the Charter of the African Union. Um, but on the other hand, there are a number of uh, governments, political systems in Africa, which uh, today, which are rooted themselves in armed insurgency, um, even though they now wear civilian clothes, as you say, and, and Uganda is a very good example of that, um, of what is essentially still a, a, a highly militarized state, and, and a state that um, um, and they're facing an election this Thursday, of course, and 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 um, the sitting president, Yoweri Museveni, um, makes much of of his revolution in the 1980s. He overthrew corrupt politicians, but his was he was a rebel. He still very dis proudly describes himself as a rebel. Um, but they they morph over time, and they and they become civilians, and they they wear nice suits, and they um, and they and they uh, suppress other insurgencies that they regard as illegitimate. So it's, there's a kind of there's been a professionalization and um, a memorialization of those armed insurgencies of the 70s and the 80s um, mm -hmm. that are now held to be kind of self right, you know, incredibly righteous and and um, full of revolutionary fervor. So there, there, there are shifts. So I, I think the longer a military state is in, is in power, um, often the more civilianized it begins to, to look or tries to look. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I think my final question then would be uh, when you're looking at, say, a group like Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, is that something that you could imagine, well, we, we see now as a, a rebel insurgency, what might mm. be the future of, say, a movement like that, you know, could it, uh, I guess the, the Nigerian state might be too strong for it to ever kind of attack the center as it were yeah yeah i mean it's it's um i, I think i think I, I guess the most obvious answer is is no you, you you cannot imagine them ever being in a position to overthrow the nigerian state because the nigerian state is too entrenched but of course Conversely, the other reason why Boko Haram has actually been so successful, if that's the right term, certainly unconquerable, is that the Nigerian state is too weak. Um, and so you, you get a, a, a huge zone up in northern Nigeria and the southern part of Niger, um, where, you know, this is, this is the kind of, I, I tell my own students that they should imagine these kind of areas as kind of creative frontier zones. Lots of violent things happen in them, but new states can can erupt uh, within them, new political orders, religious systems and so on. Um, whether or not they're strong enough to overthrow sitting regimes um, is sometimes often the wrong question. Do they even want to do that? Um, mm. And I think it, it may well be that for Boko Haram, for example, um, it's sufficient to carve out, you know, some idea of a caliphate or whatever it might be. and um, wage perennial yeah. war against uh, 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 against infidels on their borders. Um, you certainly, 
sometimes get the sense with movements like Boko Haram that they 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 don't want the infidel to be completely conquered because then what's the point of um, you know um, a lot of a lot of the culture um, of recruitment and and the ideologies around militarism that they develop. Um, but there's no doubt that one um, one theme that um, I certainly encourage my students to look at is the idea of the of the relationship between the periphery and the center um, and how interchangeable those can be um, if you take the right kind of time frame that that you know what look like a hopeless insurgencies one day can actually end up sitting in the presidential palace um, the next um, partly because of their own military prowess but also of course um, changes in in um, global politics um, uh, regional shifts, um, outside levels of outside support, and, and, and so on. Um, but there's no doubt that movements like Boko Haram represent longer term kind of um, discontent within a state like Nigeria um, and yeah. um, often draw on deeper identities, which are, which are um, uh, as Muslims, but also as um, people between states. So pe people, communities that inhabit liminal spaces, really. With well, uh, kind of like witness of that central state and the the peripherals. I mean, you like in Sudan, you've seen the country sort of break apart and could break apart even further because yeah. it was, in a sense, all too big to control. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this turned into very, you know, <laughs> it's a very interesting discussion. We've got um. Time for one question, and someone's put in the, the chat. Uh, lots of people said, Oh, this is really interesting. So, on, thank you for you know what you've said. Um, final question What might the future hold? I know that Africa is a large continent with many countries, but where do you what what do what, what role do you see the conflict the future? Would they localize or will they be between states, as it were? Is there anything that might arise in the future where which could be one for us all to watch yeah <laughs> um well this 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 is the one uh, in your mind, this, yeah. <laughs> yeah this is the elephant trap um where people say oh you know watch this and of course nothing ever happens um i think i, I think one thing i'd i'd the one thing i'd point to is um a more recent development again within the african union um that that uh, is very keen to develop more in the way of uh, in, in, interstate military cooperation. And, and you get that um, much more now than you would have done, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I think there's a, there's, there's a recognition that um, when professional military outfits attached to more or less legitimate states act together um, in the common interest, then the, the, they can achieve more. So that's something I think will, will probably continue. And you might even see that expanding a bit more. Um, yeah, there was a yeah. particular article in the, in the African Union's charter from 2000s, which kind of makes this explicit that there's, a, that, you know, there's, there's an alliance for this. Um, at the same time, let me kind of um, flip that uh, uh, and, and suggest that um, another development will be, well, will continue to be um, uh, particular states using their military might to attach themselves to external powers in the uh, uh, in pursuit of those external powers strategic interests, which is a slightly long winded way of saying that there's a bunch of countries that are desperately keen to attach themselves to a Joe Biden administration in, uh, with all the kind of financial and military benefits that that will bring. Mm. Um, and uh, they've done it, for example, in, in, in fighting uh, what, they, what they see as Islamic um, extremism. Um, but they often use those militaries to suppress um, domestic dissent. Um, that's been quite a recent trend and I, I, I expect that to continue. That, that soldiers, serving soldiers, are very keen on those uh, yeah, Western yeah. links because it, 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 in a sense, it solidifies their position irrespective of um, civilian 
governments. Those those governments can come and go, but armies can often be the gatekeepers of yeah. that kind of relationship. Yeah, and in some ways that foreign intervention, because if you've got a conflict in your country that the that a, a Western power might disapprove of, as in Boko Haram, then yeah, that you, the the central government can actually draw down resources in their fight against it, as it were, you know, from the foreign powers. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. And um, um, yeah, um, and we've seen this, you know, when the when the French deployed soldiers in in, in Niger a few years ago, and um, so so exactly, it's 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 a point. It, the, the term that we often use is gatekeeping, and and those those the ability of sitting regimes to draw down those alliances. And they're fighting these these common external threats, um, but they're consolidating their own positions um, as they do so. It's a win-win for them. Okay, uh, we've got a, a question in the stream. Engaging. Oh, don't know what's happened. Uh, I'm not sure what's happened. This is conversation. If there's still time, I'd like to throw a quick question. I'm sure that you've seen, uh, it's quite long. He leans, have some, something about uh, Dan Hicks's new book, The Brutish Museums. He leans heavily on the concept of small wars, which hasn't really been spoken about, uh, which, you know, I, th I think we've touched on, but like some more details. Does it shift how we think about warfare and specifically the temporary war time on the continent in relation to colonialism in the 19th century. There's a question about some wars taking place in Africa. Uh, talking about Dan Hicks's book, Brutish Wars. If you, you're aware of that, Richard? Yeah, I, 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 I know of it. I haven't actually um, uh, had a chance to look at it. Now, so you, you, you broke up slightly there, but is is so is the question about essentially the the the, the notion of of small wars? Yes, the notion of small wars. How, in a sense, they, they were engendered by colonialism, um, or may have been engendered by colonial powers in order to gain advantage. One group warring against another. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. The um, I I. I'm I'm not I'm not sure I'd kind of um, go with the idea that 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 um, colonial intervention itself generates uh, a practice that we could call small wars. Small mm -hmm. wars, of course, it, it refers to um, quite explicitly to a, a very famous 1896 text, which was reprinted several times by a uh, by a Colonel Charles Calwell. Um, um, and uh, the idea was that, you know, as, as empires expanded, um, European armies had to fight these small wars, which were often very frustrating because the enemy didn't behave in the way that normal um, civilized people do and so on. Um, but there's no, uh, th th I think the more interesting element of that question actually is 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 how Europeans took advantage of, of that conflict. And I think that's absolutely yeah. right. Um, actually, the questioner is asked about sort of the, the stealing of objects and, and war booty and so on within those walls. So please continue, Colin. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, um, absolutely. Um, but I'll come back to that in a second. But the, yes, the, um, um, a lot of, the the success of European empire building is really rooted in um, their ability to achieve leverage um, in terms of conflicts which were already ongoing and and driving wedges further between particular communities that had already been um, uh, in, in conflict with one another. So those those um, small wars of the imperial era so-called which is which was actually quite a kind of dismissive term to describe what were often mm. very bloody and actually very large conflicts um they served europeans um purposes the great irony there of course was that they they used those wars to establish empire in africa and then turned around and accused africans of being warlike um and and the whole justification for colonialism was that we stopped these wars but they they they, they used those wars to actually gain entry to a number of states and societies um, and yes, in the process, they stole lots of stuff 
um, and have not yet um, uh, given it back. And there is, you know, I, I take my kids to the um, uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum here in Oxford um, quite a lot, or, you know, we did before it was all closed. Um, and, um, you know, it's impossible not to go in there and feel uncomfortable because you know that a great uh, deal of that collection is the result directly or indirectly of the kinds of violence that, uh, that we do, uh, uh, I hope, increasingly associate with imperialism. Um, yeah. You know, it's not just stuff that magically appears in glass cabinets. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Kind of the whole, in a sense, people beginning to piece things together about very much about military museums, whole, whole collections of stuff, yeah. often badly labelled. I know there's a whole project going on about Sudan at the moment and objects from the Mardist era that were captured in the the war of like 1898, 97, 98, you know, that period and, you know, whole stuff that was just taken quite you know culturally very important yeah. objects really all over africa but yeah that, that's... In, with with the, the you, you go in there and you, you see there's kind of yellowing labels yeah you know i, I once went to the sterling music you know sterling castle yeah uh in scotland you have like the the um the museum of the argyle and southern highlanders and there were a, a number of about three or four men who looked like they were from the Yemen for me and I realized they were just looking at their own country's history you know they've come all the way they were really excited looking in the, the stuff from the Aden conflict conflict of the 1960s really you know they all gathered around these glass cases and thought what's going on here and then I kind of you know went over and had a look myself and I worked out what, what they were doing really but they were really kind of like just really looking at this stuff um, you know, that's where your history can be. Richard, that's been really very interesting. Um, you know, people have been very complimentary in the stream, found that very interesting. Um, thanks for thanks for taking part, uh, you know, and like um, giving your time up for our venture. It's been really, uh, you know, great having you as a guest and listening to what, what you had to say and your studies yeah wouldn't mind getting you back next year to talk about uh some of the the more modern wars in the colonial era that you know would be i'd be happy to about. yeah oh brilliant yeah okay all maybe right maybe we can meet in person i oh, no, that would be wonderful yeah um yeah inside the webinar thanks a lot okay i think we've done our job or you have anyway. All right, Richard. Bye. Take bye. care. Bye. Evening all. Stay safe. Bye bye.